Hello and a very warm welcome to this, the 19th Wednesday webinar that we've put on and the 5th of 2021. Tonight is on about buying a horse and you're very welcome and I hope you really enjoy and get out a lot of this evening's webinar. Now, this is our 19th webinar and I think I've asked this before, but it would be great to know for those who are joining us tonight and you're joining us by Zoom, how many of our webinars you've been to before? 5, 10, 15 or in, has anyone out there been, is this their 19th? If so, you're very welcome. You're equally welcome if this is your first webinar that you've joined us uh, for. And all our webinars are recorded on our YouTube channel and uh, so please do refer back to them there. And a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live for this, our fifth Wednesday webinar of 2021 on buying a horse. Um, the aim of our webinars is very simple. It's just to bring external experts and the World Health Welfare team to provide us as horse owners some guidance to help us make us better horse owners, which is obviously something we're all striving to be. And I'm tonight, I'm delighted to, to be joined by uh, a friend and colleague, Ben Mays, who's an extremely experienced equine veterinarian, and also two of the World Horse Welfare team, Alison Willimant and Tony Evans. Now tonight is very much a two-way conversation. Ben's going to give us a 25-minute uh, presentation and then very shortly after that then we'll have a 10-minute presentation from Alison and Tony and then we go to the Q&A and that's really very much where we, we want you all to be involved. If you're joining us on Facebook then please put your questions in the comments section and if you're joining us on Zoom then please put your questions in the Q&A function. By all means use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves but please use the Q&A function on Zoom because it's so much easier for us to pick up on them. And also, if you're on Zoom, you can always upvote other people's questions. So you don't necessarily need to ask your own question if someone's already asked it. So please do that. As I've mentioned just to the Zoom audience just now, all of our previous webinars are on uh, our YouTube channel. So please do go back and refer to them. Please do get, get involved tonight. If you're on Facebook Live, please do share the live video. And we, we are planning on doing more webinars through 2021. So if you've got thoughts on what we might uh, use as topics for those future webinars, then please let us know on education at worldhorsewelfare.org. Please email, email us on that um, address. Now our next webinar, which is in a fortnight's time, is going to be on alternative grazing systems. What are they? What we mean, we're going to focus on track systems, the equicentral system, rewilding, and the use of woodlands and moorlands. And we'll put up a link for you to register for that very shortly. Now, before um, we go into the main, I'm going to share my screen, which is always a great challenge um, for those of you who've been before, but there you go. Um, and now I'm gonna try and give you a poll question. Now, if you are joining us on Facebook Live, you won't be able to do this, but you can always put the answer in, in the comments section. But for, the, for those of you joining us by Zoom, you'll be able to do this poll. The last time you brought a horse, did you have a pre-purchase examination done by a vet? Very simple, three answers, yes, no, or I've never bought a horse. Whilst you are answering that question, I'm just going to explain a little bit about World Horse Welfare, a charity that was founded in 1927 um, and very much supports the horse human partnership and in that regard we provide care we promote research we shape laws and we raise welfare standards through education often in partnership all of those aspects uh, with other organizations and of course this evening's webinars are very much around providing that education and we as i said earlier these are the, um, the topics are to help us as owners uh, be better owners and tonight's topic is about how to buy a horse and we want to start with where you should start in your pre-purchase preparation how you the really important bit of being honest to yourself throughout that process practical advice about how what to expect from a pre-purchase examination and the most common traps that the unwary buyers can fall into so i really hope it's going to be a really interesting session and lots to discuss in our q a afterwards and before i move on to introduce brett ben 
Um, Basil, could we have the answers to the poll? Just to see, there's no right or wrong answer to this, of course. It's just to give a flavour. Well, look at that. It's a, a really interesting split. Nearly half have, but a just over a quarter of you didn't have a pre-purchase examination. It'd be really interesting to draw out the reasons why. Uh, and about a quarter have never bought a horse, which is very good because you can always rehome one from Wells Horse Welfare. But more of that later. So now I'm going to move on to introduce Ben who, as I said, is a very experienced veterinarian. Um, and uh, unfortunately for Ben, I know him quite well. So there's lots of things I could tell you about him. But suffice to say, he at university was a modern pentathlete and got a half blue um, competing for Cambridge University against the other university. Um, he actually, um, whether he still does it today, but he's an amazing robotics dancer. And maybe during the course of this evening, we'll see a little bit of that. Uh, but possibly more relevantly, when he qualified, one of the first foalings he was called out to was to a one Sebastian Coe. This was in the mid 90s before uh, the, the, the London Olympics were even thought of. And at those days, he was obviously an Olympic, uh, still is an Olympic gold medal winner, medal winner. And in fact, when Ben got out to Sebastian Coe's, the, mo the foal had already been happily born um, and therefore his first experience was drinking champagne with Sebastian Coe. How many people can say they've done that? Ben, with that introduction, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Roly. I'm just going to do a few little um, housekeeping points myself. Um, so hopefully my first slide is up for all of you to see. So yeah, you're, good. you're thinking of buying a horse and we're, we're the, the, it is certainly full of traps for the unwary. Um, if you're buying a horse or it, you're, you're involved in such a massive industry, we, the equine industry, are the 12th biggest industry in the UK with a nine billion pound impact, about the same as agriculture. So it's, it's a big old thing, this horse world, and, and you're thinking of entering it um, and uh, buying and selling it is a significant part of it. But there is somewhat full of pitfalls. Um, and uh, staying on the, is only one of them. Um, firstly, I mean, do you know how much these horses cost? Budgeting is absolutely key to the whole process. Thinking about where you're going to keep it, livery, shoeing, vets fees, insurance, um, competition, transport, um, uh, and planning for uh, unexpected events. So horses do cost a lot of money. The purchase of them and paying for the vetting of them is is small fry compared with the cost of keeping them um you know somewhere between five and fifteen thousand pounds is not unusual for an annual cost depending on your level of competition and what you're intending to do the others may well talk about that a bit more than i do but it's really important that you know what you're getting yourself into um and when you're thinking of buying the horse uh, no one can predict the future we don't know what's going to happen the horse might drop dead tomorrow. Things do change. Um, and the, the outgoings of buying the animal uh, and, and purchasing it really must be considered a luxury item. It shouldn't be an investment. Even if you're thinking along those lines of, of selling again or making a profit, it shouldn't be an investment. You shouldn't be using um, money that you don't really have to buy these animals. It's like a, I always think of it like a holiday. It's a five grand, 10 grand purchase. Um, and that's money that you, you are essentially spending on luxury items that may just disappear. Think about what your expectations are in terms of what you want from this animal. Think about where you're going to keep it. Are you going to keep it in livery or are you going to keep it at home and so on? Um, and, and this is even if you're a hardened, experienced person, you need to be aware of, of what you're doing, where you're going to keep it. Um, and also any um, uh, sort of plans if, if you disappear, if you get hospitalized? Is there someone else to look after the animal? Are there contingency plans and so on? A few, a few key tips and we're seeing a lot of these things actually um, happening for the worse during the COVID crisis. Uh, many of you may be aware there's a bit of a bubble in the equine market at the moment. Values of horses are about 1.5 to uh, almost to two times what they were pre-COVID um, and there's a bit of a feeding frenzy going on bit of a bubble in terms of buying and there's many people out there buying blind i'm vetting horses probably 20 to 30 percent of the horses that i'm vetting at the moment and i vet around uh, 200 a year are being bought without the people actually seeing the animal based on just videos uh, and uh, and conversations and so on and that is unwise 
um, lots of things. Videos can be edited, as you well know. Uh, do your research. Uh, a lot of research can be done on individual animals, um, not just the, the, the seller, but the animals on the internet um, and uh, uh, looking at TikTok and, and you th see things like refusals and so on that you didn't know about. Um, look at uh, records, BS records, BE records, whatever, they're all there, jump by jump, what has happened and it may not be what you think you're buying. If you're going to see a horse, always take a friend or, or preferably um, a, an experienced um, horse person or even a qualified instructor with you to look at the animal or at very least ask your friends and, um, uh, and your horse expert to look at the videos and advise you uh, as someone you trust and try out the animal in every aspect you can um, um, for what you want it take it down the road try some clippers try um, certainly see it being transported um, really try out the animal don't just take the seller's word for it and then ideally try out the animal twice um, and then then think about getting a vetting, as we said, an independent vetting. Now, vetting is, a, is, a, is an age old thing. It's a, it's a well known term within the English language, uh, very different to doctoring. A vetting is a positive thing. Um, we call them in, in the trade of pre-purchase examination. The an acronym for that PPE is somewhat dwarfed by other, other, other items these days. And a five stage, which is a full vetting, costs around three to four hundred pounds, depending on travel and so on. But that, that's the sort of outlay you're looking at for a five stage examination. You may well have heard of a two stage examination, what we call a limited pre-purchase examination, which is around a hundred pound less. Um, it's still a fairly comprehensive examination. We'll run through the stages. It's basically the first two stages of a five stage, but the vet is spending less time with the animal and that is an important part of the process. I'd strongly recommend using uh, an experienced vet and most of the vets um, involved in vettings are experienced. No one really does vetting for at least their first two years of qualification. They have to attend specific courses before they can even get involved in vetting and we find amongst our younger vets really they're not really wanting to do vetting until at least five years out of vet school even if they're horsey themselves. Um, the key to any vetting is communication. Um, communication between you, the vet, um, and uh, and keeping that up all the way along. And sometimes with some vets, because they're busy people, they're always late and so on, you may have to drive that, but insist on speaking to the vet before the examination and immediately after the examination if you can't be there. Always better to be there. And the vet at the end will form an opinion. Uh, I've put their pass or fail. As a profession, we try and avoid the terms pass or fail. Um, but um, it's still, it is there enshrined in the whole process. We, we recommend purchase based on the risk assessment that we have carried out on the animal. Um, and the relevance of the parcel fails thing will come to light later on. Um, again, before the vetting, does the animal have a history? A competition history, we've talked about check, checking the websites and so on. Um, the owner history, work, that's often readily available within the passport. Now, this is, I think, quite controversial, particularly in these days of GDPR, that you can look in a passport and see all the people that have ever owned it and their addresses and so on, but it still seems to be the case. So uh, um, instead of looking up that person in three months down the line and finding out the animal was, was never to be sold or was retired and so on, it's best trying to look that up before the event. So uh, maybe if you see the passport when you're trying out the animal, perhaps take a photocopy, a photograph of that page and attempt to contact the previous owners if that's what you're considering to doing. Sometimes it's better not to know, but, but there you go. The other person is who is selling the horse? Is the person that is showing you the horse selling you the horse or is there somewhere else? Is there a middleman? There's several middle people involved in this sale. Quite often the case when you start looking into it. And that's certainly something I start looking into when I'm doing the vetting. Um, the person who's actually selling you the horse is the person you are going to pay the money to, whose bank account you put it in. And that is a legal transaction. Legally in, in the UK, horses don't really have a status. They're not farm animals. Um, they're not um, companion animals as such. They are considered property legally. And the only proof of purchase and proof of ownership is a receipt and the transference of money. A passport is not proof of ownership, but, but evidence of a transfer of, of, of money is. So um, who are you going to be paying at the end? And often I find myself asking that at a vetting. So I know who to put who the seller is on the passport or on the vetting certificate. And, the, and there's, the buyer has got no idea who is actually selling the horse. 
Um, veterinary history is, is important and some vets now insist on seeing the veterinary history from previous owners. Unfortunately, this can lead to some dark practices, particularly by dealers in covering up who the previous owners are um, and, and other, other uh, professional people using, people using multiple vets. So there are different histories and they can pick and choose which history they share with you and who they tell you the vet is and so on. So it is difficult. And also veterinary history uh, becomes prior knowledge for your veterinary surgeon doing the vetting. And this has quite profound insurance implications, which may uh, influence whether you wish to buy the horse. So sometimes it is, a, uh, I'd like personally to look at the horse on the day to probe the, uh, the, the seller about veterinary history, to see how they respond and then, then decide whether I think they're um, um, telling. There's always a grain of truth in what they're saying when you're talking to the seller, um, instead of necessarily going back to their previous vets and getting a long printout. But other vets do like having a long printout, but that tends to mean that the animal never gets vetted in the first place. Above all here, we've got to have realistic expectations of a, if an animal is 10 years old, it is going to have previous veterinary history. That is not necessarily a bad thing. Things do get better and your expectations may be different. Um, a value of an animal is always in its potential and potential goes down with time. Um, and you might be buying a horse that had the potential to be um, a million pound dressage horse when it was three, but he's now a perfectly competent um, low level novice dressage horse um, at a lower price and your expectations are therefore different. Um, as I said, the passport history is also important. I often look at it to look at the vaccination history so I can actually see from the vaccination history which vets have vaccinated the horse and then I can look around um, um, to see whether the, 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 the stories tally as the horse has been seen to move around the country. So why have it, have it vetted? As we saw at the beginning of the 75% or so of people watching this uh, webinar, um, only uh, a third of those um, um, don't have a horse vetting. Two thirds of them did have the horse vetting, uh, vetted. So uh, there, is a, there are plenty significant people out there who don't think they should have it vetted. Um, the key is, even if you're examining a horse, a vetting you cannot predict the future. I cannot predict what will happen to this horse tomorrow. And that's what you, the buyer, expecting me to do. So please manage your expectations of what a vetting is. It's an on the day examination and it's giving you more information about what you're buying. I'm risk assessing it. I'm an experienced practitioner. And the key word there is an independent practitioner. So you're booking a vetting, you've committed to buying this animal and you've probably paid a deposit to the seller. That's really going on at the moment um, because of this uh, bubble I was talking about. The key there with that deposit is you by all means pay a deposit subject to vetting, but please don't pay a deposit subject to passing a vetting. We do a risk assessment. We might find things on there which other people will think it's absolutely fine to buy a horse, for example, with sarcoids, but somebody else might not. Um, and therefore, I feel obliged that I can't say don't buy this horse because of sarcoids. I feel I, I can say positively, you should buy this horse, it's got sarcoids, but you might not want to buy it. But you've paid a deposit subject to me saying um, um, don't buy this horse. If you want that deposit back, you, I've got to say don't buy this horse. And I'm not really going to say that if it's got something that you don't like, but I think is fine. Um, so you're we get into this terrible situation where you, the seller, are telling me to fail the horse so you can get your deposit back because you don't sign something I've found on an animal and an animal is never perfect. So please just pay your deposit subject to vetting, not subject to passing a vet. Um, booking, a, it's a little thing dealers like to get a bit of extra money for, by the way. Uh, booking and vetting. I've said here um, that I need to be experienced and independent. And now the dealer may well have a little list of vets that, that he thinks um, that you should be using. I think you should be choosing the vet, not the dealer or, or the seller for that matter. Now, they may not have so-and-so, the certain vet on the yard, and perhaps we can work with that. You should ask your own vet or someone you trust which vet you should recommend. I think that's really important. Independence is key. Now, I commonly don't, you see down the bottom there, I commonly do vettings where I am the vet for the seller and the buyer. I make it really clear to the buyer, it's a declaration of interest that I am vet also for the seller. Now, I also declare it if I do a lot of vettings in this yard, say I do three vettings a month in a dealer's yard, I'm not their vet, 
but I do have that interest in that I do three vettings there a month. And if I fail a few, they'll probably kick me off the yard. So it's really important I declare that interest. And however hard I try to work on your behalf, um, but that person is still a client of mine. I still have some sort of commitment to this. We had this when home buyer packs were bought out and trialed that the, the home seller was uh, paying for the survey and it just didn't work. So my strong advice, even though most of us do do vettings where we are the vet for the seller, try and use someone independent. Really, really try. Someone recommended by your own vet or someone else. It may be someone on the dealer's list, but it needs to be someone that you, you can trust. Um, there you go. The buyer may persuade you not to have a vetting. They like to produce old vettings with the names and addresses of the people on the vetting sort of um, tipexed out um, uh, and they really just doesn't wash um, and they always try and push you to have a two stage and a five stage you then ask us should I have a two stage or a five stage we're always going to say a five stage it's up to you if you want to have a limited pre-purchase examination you really need to know what it's about and we never just do eyes heart and lungs we will always do a two stage which includes a soundness evaluation so you've got to decide on this experienced independent vet and then you find they're not available for two weeks. So there, sometimes there does have to be compromise. When someone rings up to book a vetting with us, they nearly always don't know the name of the person selling the horse or where they live or who they are. So please perhaps do some a little bit of homework before you're thinking of parking with your £10,000. Please just be a little bit sensitive. Um, um, we will look into we will do due diligence and look to see if we've ever come across that horse we'll put the microchip number into our um, practice management systems we'll put the sellers names any names you give us into the practice management system you're often buying a horse that's called um, Sharon or Dobbin or Echo or Puzzle that's not its real name we'd like to know its real name too um, don't be surprised that we ask you to pay beforehand if we fail the horse or could tell the examination. Often we never hear or see from the, the buyer again uh, and they don't pay for it. So we, we often get caught out and still don't get five to ten vettings paid for a year. So we do ask for payment up front and we will refund you if it's, uh, the full examination is not carried out. Try to attend the vetting. You will get far more out of it. It may be difficult. Um, but above all, communicate and uh, speak to the vet beforehand as well as after the examination. OK, on the day, we'll do the best we can. The, the weather's terrible. We're late. The animals lost a shoe and so on. So the important thing is we do all communicate. And sometimes we have to can't do the vetting because of these things have happened. But we will do our best. Uh, the five stages of the vetting, remember the first two are the two-stage examination. We do a full physical examination. We look in the eyes of the ophthalmoscope, use a stethoscope, both sides, feel the legs all over, examine the feet. We do examine that animal top to toe and feeling for lumps and bumps. All the time, I'm probing the seller about anything they, they tell me about the horse in terms of how long they've had it, what it can do, what it can't do, and so on, where it's been before. And I, I, I'm reasonably good these days at Detecting, detecting what is that grain of truth and what isn't. So uh, that, that's a really valuable and the longest period of the examination often. Okay, stage two is the trot up phase. Remember this is in your LPPE as well. Uh, we do a full evaluation. Now these days, uh, I also lunge the animal on the soft if, that, if a school is available. I think that's really valuable. I see it trot both ways. I see it do trot to canter transitions both ways, obviously assuming it's trained to do so. And I find those transitions really important to me in terms of evaluating uh, what stage of equitation that animal is at at as well as its soundness. So that's the stage two. And if we were doing an LPPE, that's where we would stop. Uh, we would just do the paperwork and uh, leave the premises. In the five stage, we then see the animal ridden. And this is really important to me. You're wanting to buy this animal to be ridden and I can see this animal being ridden. Yes, that often the, um, the uh, seller has produced a, a, a professional rider for the purpose, but I like to feel as experienced that I can see through that. I, mean, I know what you are. I've spoken to you long and hard before the vetting about what your expectations and ability is. So I can look at how this animal goes and I can report back to you if you're not there, what happens if it's spooked, if it's canter transition was a bit poor, if it went disunited, all these sort of things. Ostensibly, it's also to listen to the heart and lungs at the end of the exercise period. But um, 
the uh, seeing how that animal goes is really important. Here, we've got a relatively novice rider riding the animal, and that's quite useful if it's being bought by a relatively novice rider. I haven't got a martingale on the animal. I can see how the head carriage is without any aids. So it is all quite useful, but we have got to think about the uh, what we've got as well. Okay, so stage four is a rest period. It's sort of almost taking a breath during the process, checking the documentation, the microchip, um, uh, having a cup of tea, catching up on the notes and just re-evaluating where we've got and taking stock before we get to stage five. I often look at the, the teeth during stage four because the animal's a bit quiet. Now this is slightly controversial, putting a full mouth speculum on and examining or inspecting the mouth with a light source. But I feel that's really important. I think it's important that you know that the animal hasn't got a tooth or whether it's ever had any tooth care at all. Um, some of the expert dental practitioners in, in the veterinary land think you can't really examine a mouth properly without sedating the animal and using oroscopes and all sorts of things. And um, so that's why I've called it a mouth inspection more than an examination. But I do think it's important. It's an important part of, of what you're buying these days, these teeth. And the final stage is the final trot up phase. And uh, we, we must lunge on the surface. This is our school uh, at the practice and we have an asphalt area within our school where we can do a firm and safe lunge on the firm. Uh, it's a contra controversial part of the vetting. It was introduced back in the uh, late 90s, uh, but it is now fully established part of the vetting. And uh, yeah, the seller's got to make some pretty darn good excuses for us not to do it. Uh, they do still try. It's a bit like uh, back in the early 80s when flexion tests were introduced. They were controversial then. Both uh, procedures have stood the test of time and there's really no argument against them now. Um, okay, what uh, vetting doesn't include are various things. Measurement's really important. If you want a pony to measure in for a showing class or BS, then really it should have a JMB certificate. And if it's over seven, why has it only got one and it's bang on the height? Really, it needs to have a full life certificate. You can't really rely on the vet not doing an official measurement and guessing that it probably will be a 14-2 if it's really important that it is. Pregnancy test, buying a mare, particularly if it's come from Ireland in the summer um, or early autumn when it, it may have got pregnant in the spring because it's just come in, that's not part of a vetting. If, you, if you're not sure, then, um, then uh, have it tested. But there is, it's not uncommon. Every year we get two for the price of one. Um, X-rays are a really important part of vetting, and now I've got a few slides on that. Scoping, again, if you're into fast work and you're eventing or the animal makes a noise, it is useful, but probably at the riding club level, it's not really the done thing. X-rays are, here we have some kissing spines on the, on the right or some X-rays showing dorsal spinous process impingement. This occurs in 50% of horses and we can ride more than 50% of horses. So it's controversial taking these X-rays. How do we interpret them? What do they mean? Here on the left, we've got a stifle with some OC in it. That animal could still be quite happy, happy jumping 160s internationally, but you know, that is used as a bargaining chip in bettings and often a, re a reason not to buy the animal. So what do all these techniques mean? Perhaps we're just complicating things, take, taking bettings. Should we be using diagnostic tools as sophisticated as x-rays to look inside an animal that doesn't have any problems on the outside? It is a, it is a controversial thing. Manchester City Football Club used to CT, MRI and everything, all their football players before they bought them. They've scrapped that. The, the risk is still the same without the examination. So do think before you ask. It do, all these things have insurance implications. At the end of the vetting, we take a blood sample. It's a routine part of a vetting. It is sent off and stored for six months. It can be retrospectively tested on your request, um, unfortunately on your expense as well, um, for medicines if there is a dispute with the seller. Its primary purpose is to act as a deterrent against dealers for giving their animals butte to make them sound, sedation to make them quiet and so on. And it has done a very good job at doing that. We only test three or four samples a year. Um, we have had a positive recently in a very expensive course, which I can tell you about later if you like. But it is an important um, it is an important part of the vetting and it is routine. It's recommended by the vets indemnity insurers. The important thing is we discuss our findings with you if you're there. And I'm slightly controversial and I like to discuss findings with the seller as well. I think it's really disingenuous. I've just spent an hour and a half this person's time, exhausted their horse and don't tell them anything. 
I think it's really important that I tell them what I find. And I've not had any trouble as long as one is a diplomatic, communicative and skilled. Probably not all vets are, but it's important to relay the findings to everybody. So I, I've shown what I've risked. And then we make the joint decision when we whether we buy that animal, you and me, my client, the buyer. We decide whether we buy that animal, depending on how we you feel that the risk I've described to you goes down. Um, we have a written report that goes on the certificate. Now, the, remember, anything that goes on that written report, a written report, will have strong insurance implications. So, if I say it's got sarcoids, you won't be discovered. You won't be covered for sarcoids. If I say it's got a skin rash, you won't be covered for anything to do with the skin. So, it's really important that we we discuss uh, everything that's happened in the betting, and I tell you what I feel must go in the report because it is a proper clinical finding and not just an impression. Insurance is important. Um, I think if you're a first time buyer, then um, insurance is probably a, a, something you should do and take out that policy before you transport the horse, turn it out with its new friends. It gets kicked in the face. It is covered straight away at the click of a button, even if I haven't produced the certificate yet. A bit like buying a car. Insure it. If you're going to insure it, insure it straight away. So what's not included in the vetting roles? How are we doing on time? You're good. About a couple of minutes. Okay, old chum. Um, what's not included? I don't do all that detailed research. I don't look for this horse on TikTok, Facebook, um, whatever else you want to look for it on. I don't look at BE results, BS results, and so on. You do that, or a representative of you does that. My daughter's remarkably good at it. Um, and I must, have said, I must say, if it's a, an expensive horse, my uh, PA is ridiculously good at finding out things about horses as well. Um, and she seems to quite take joy in finding them. So uh, we do do a bit of research, but that's not our job. That's your job. But please do it. Um, we don't get involved in stable devices. Clearly, if I see an animal wind sucking, weaving, box walking, I will tell you. I will tell you everything that that horse does when I am in its presence, whether it moves off when it's mounted, whether anything it does, I will tell you. But there are a lot of things I don't see. So it's worth you asking the seller. And if you have a particular concern, then seek a warranty from that seller. Um, and obviously, even though I've said what I'm going to put in the report and so on, I cannot I say what I cannot speak for insurers as to what they will cover you for and what they won't cover you for. This is particularly true with, with x-rays. I've, I've examined the x-rays. I've recommended purchase. I've said that what I find on the x-rays within the normal limits for an animal that age and use and so on. But the insurance vet doesn't get around to look at those x-rays for six months. It's then you get very excited with me that I said the x-rays were fine. I'm not there to insure the animal. I'm there to tell you whether to buy it or not. And I really can't do, you know, I cannot predict the future. We're doing in this together. We're doing a risk assessment for the animal you want to purchase. It is an animal. It's not perfect. We've got to manage our expectations, communicate well and do our best. So at the end of this vetting, I'll give you an opinion. Um, this is slightly controversial globally in terms of vets and, and vettings. Uh, I've been quite a lot involved in international vetting committees and, and symposia and et cetera. And we're fairly unique in the UK that we give you this opinion. In, in Holland, every, all the dealers say, well, why can't we do it like the Dutch? Because it's a tick box exercise. So but it, you don't get anything out of a Dutch vetting. If a horse comes with a Dutch vetting, really, really beware. They're just ticking boxes. It's very controlled. They, the, the, the size of the lung school has to be perfect. The, the, the people involved, the x-rays, they, they're all graded and so on. But, but the actual, they don't tell you what they think of the animal. They don't tell you whether they think it's capable of doing what you want it for and so on. So my opinion is based on the suitability of the animal of what you tell me about yourself and your circumstances. And I will talk you through that. So don't hold anything back when you're telling me um, what you are. You know, you get to that point when I've vetted this beautiful 14-2 show pony and you haven't told me that you're 18 stone. It's really quite important. Um, so these opinions based on the findings of the day and any prior knowledge I have gleaned. Now, if you, I've got prior knowledge, veterinary history, something you've told me or so on. If I think that affects the purchase of the animal, um, I need to declare that on the certificate. So be slightly wary that I, if any prior knowledge I have of that animal, and I think it affects the future use of that animal, I have to declare it. So that's where that veterinary history thing at the beginning um, previous veterinary history can get a little bit touchy. 
Um, my opinion is based on the balance of probabilities. So that's just saying we can't predict the future, but I think based on what I've seen today, this animal is suitable for what you want. And those things can be hacking, schooling, low level competition. These are all things I use, terms I use when you told me what you want the animal for. This is what I put on the certificate. Um, so general riding and, and jumping with um, riding club activities is one of my favorite ones to put on a certificate. But you tell me you want it for eventing and it's a four year old and it has never been cross country. I'm not gonna put on that certificate that it's suitable for eventing. I might put on that it's suitable for bringing on for eventing Producing is the, 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 the correct term, but I actually on the certificate put the word bringing on because I think it is, but I can't tell you it's going to like ditches or, or anything like that. So I'm a bit nervous of saying, yeah, fine, it's suitable for eventing uh, specifically. Um, if it is already an eventer or a show jumper and it's got a record and so on, then that's fair enough. That's what it's suitable for. Um, and uh, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, wasn't it? I, I apologize for that. Um, you know, uh, the, the slides will be up for some time, and uh, I have no idea what I've just said. That's it. <laughs> you know exactly what you just said, Ben, and that was excellent. As you say, it was a whistle stop tour, and it's been brilliant because we've st started lots of questions that started to come in. And just a reminder if you're on Zoom, please do upvote uh, the questions that are there. There's lots of questions about x rays, about karmas, and, and, and potentially horses that signs for horses that have been potentially doped before they've been, they go for a vetting. So please do have a look at those questions and do upvote them. It's really interesting tonight because for last few webinars we've had a truly sort of international audience and we've got an international audience tonight we've got people joining us from Croatia Poland and the US but not surprisingly lots more people from the UK because as Ben said there it does vary obviously from country to country so Ben thank you very very much indeed that was really good you mentioned Manchester City uh, Football Club um, Basil um, who along with Janet is is is, is very much sort of the, the back team uh, for today uh, Basil's a great Chelsea supporter so from about nine minutes time when Chelsea starts playing we might lose all connection if so uh, you'll know why uh, only joking of course now um, I've got to share my screen again um, once I can do that there we go and I'm going to ask you this is not in any way a sort of performance related but a question about Ben's uh, 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 presentation but obviously we, we asked you previously had have you previously ha had a horse vetting just having heard what Ben said uh, are you likely to have a pre-purchase examination done by a vet? Um, and so yes, no, I'm unlikely ever to buy a horse. So a slightly different question, but I hope that sort of stimulated just to get a feel. And it's very much for you just to get a feel for what Ben's told us. And then and for, leading on from that, what the uh, questions are that uh, you will ask during the question and answer session, which is going to follow Alison and Tony. Now, um, as I mentioned, Tony and Alison are part of the World Horse Welfare team. Um, when I asked Alison for a quirky fact, she said um, she has a passion for anything equine, but especially zebras. Um, and the notes say um, she would love to see them in the wild one day or possibly one in a World Horse Welfare Centre. Now, I very much doubt we'll ever see a zebra in a World Horse Welfare Centre because over the years we have tried to domesticate the zebra and have failed remarkably uh, because th they are truly wild animals and not to be domesticated. Um, I'm sure many of you know, but a group of zebras is called a dazzle or sometimes a herd or a zeal. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not quite sure why um, Alison has a, um, a great interest in zebras. Maybe she'll tell us why. And then Tony, who is also uh, who was one of our field officers. I've known Tony for a, a long time, but from back in his time in the military. Um, and I do know Tony, Tony's other half. And th this made me laugh because he's currently banned from bringing anything else home for his long suffering wife to look after. In the past, he has brought home three day old foals, donkeys, orphan lambs. But she finally lost the plot when he managed to catch a Highland bullock and put it in a barn for her to look after. Well, if you put it in the barn for her to look after, I'm not surprised she lost the plot. Um, so um, before I hand over, I think Tony's going to speak first and then Alison. Um, Basil, are you going to give us the answers to the poll? 
Uh, well, if uh, Ben, if you're on performance related pay, you've just received your bonus because um, 95% have said they would um, uh, next time buy a horse are likely to have a pre purchase examination. Only 2% said no. But interestingly, only 3% of you um, are unlikely ever to buy a horse. But remember, even if you do buy a horse, you can still rehome a companion from World Horse Welfare. So over to Tony. Good evening, all. Now, in our presentation this evening, you will hear and see some repetition between myself, Alison and Ben. That is because we want to hammer home our message of you doing the right research and making that right decision. Buying a horse is a huge personal and financial commitment. It's a little bit like marriage. If it all goes wrong, there can be both financially, financial and emotional issues at stake. And in a recent study, <clears throat> excuse me, the horse human relationship by Harriet Clough, over 92% of those questioned consider the horse to be a member of the family. So maybe it's no surprise that finding the right horse can be a tricky process. But let's start with a quote. Being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise. Ask yourself those awkward questions you may not want to hear or even um, ask yourself. There is, there is an importance to have a clear mindset of what your requirements are to avoid any headaches and further issues down the line. Beginning with finances, just being honest with ourselves, however uncomfortable it is, and the process of writing down uh, what is affordable makes deficits much harder to ignore. Overstretching ourselves from day one could put us as owners under a lot of pressure and potentially compromise our horse's welfare further down the line. Much like Ben said, being realistic whilst we can't predict the future can give us the opportunity to take steps which may help safeguard our commitments, like planning a contingency or emergency fund in case of a change in circumstances. think to ourselves now even before we start to look at horses and adverts what do we actually want what do we want to achieve what is our ability and what is our honest experiences and what is our end goal for our partnership obviously other factors to bear in mind is where we're we going to keep the horse are we going to be blessed and be able to keep it at home or have we got to have it in a diy yard um, or even on full livery have, is, is there arenas there? What is their turnout like? What is their hacking like? Um, and everything else. All these things you need to bear in mind before you start to research your purchase and take into account your lifestyle and the actual time you have available to spend with your horse. Now ask yourself, have I got the time, money, experience, facilities to achieve exactly what I want? Writing down the wish list might be helpful. Asking ourselves, as Tony said, what is important? What is the role of the horse we want? Is it to be a companion, ridden, driven? What is acceptable or not acceptable, such as behaviours or experience? What are our personal preferences? Maybe a colour or a breed, but also our non-negotiables. What will we not be removed? What will we not be moved on? We can then compare this to our current level of experience. And now that we've been honest with ourselves and developed a realistic wish list and possibly identified some knowledge gaps as well, we're ready to move forward into researching the market. With today's technology, the internet is the preferred way of advertising horses for sale as it works very well for both sellers and buyers. We can look at the market online and see what is available and most importantly, what we can afford. If we have identified gaps in our knowledge, we might be able to start to fill those too. If our requirements are set to a specific breed, not only do we want to check that the characteristics of that breed will suit our lifestyle, experience and facilities, but also, for example, if we wanted to compete in certain classes, that the horse is eligible in terms of breeding, height or type. Once we start to look at specific horses, there are also checks that can be done from the adverts themselves. This could be really important. There are a minority of unscrupulous sellers who offer little benefit to the horse or owner. 
World Horse Welfare often receive calls from people who haven't carried out this early research and have ended up in the hands of such a seller. The internet is the main advertising tool now we, what, what we use when we're looking for horses. Most sites have a search engine, which you can narrow down your search. But when you're looking at, uh, at a horse, what draws us in? Well, firstly, I think of the three Ps, the photo, the price and the paragraph. The photo, this is what draws us in. This is what attracts us to that horse. Then the price, that is the main deal, the deal breaker. You know, is it in our budget or is it out of our budget? And then lastly is the detail and the description. This is where we need to look at the wording. And after we've made out our wish list, like Alison said, go through your negotiables and your non-negotiables, things that you can put up with and things that you can't put up with. In general, the seller should be describing its age, its height, its colour, whether it's good to box, shoe and clip, its career to date, or its potential, and in what discipline. Its way of going, whether it would suit a novice, or whether it suit a more experienced rider, any vices or, or blemishes, all, the, all these descriptions should come out, <clears throat> excuse me, in the advert. Remember, the chances of you actually ticking all the boxes on your wish list are actually quite slim. However, if you use your wish list correctly, you should then be able to move on to the next sort of stage in the pre-purchase, and that is then effective communication with the seller. Here, you need to have prepared a list of questions that you want to ask about the horse and tell the seller what you are actually looking for and your aspirations. Don't be afraid to be honest with them and tell them. And please do accept the fact that some sellers may turn around and say, to the potential buyer that in actual fact I don't think this horse is going to be suited to you for whatever reason. Listen to their advice. So having spoken to the seller on the phone the next stage would be then to see um, a live viewing. Here you need to take professional advice, ask your instructor, ask somebody, a fellow yard rider um, on, on the yard or someone with a little bit maybe more experience than yourself to look at the advert that you're, you're thinking about and look at the horse. And you want here somebody to guide you into what you want to hear um, and who can advise you well. So the next stage would be the viewing. Once again, you would need all the questions that you want to ask um, the potential seller when you get uh, onto the yard. What's its history, its routine, its work program? Um, it's turnout, it's stabling, it's veterinary his history, um, and do all these fit into your wish list. It's very important to have a clear sort of um, guided path uh, when you're going to see a horse, because you, when you go to a strange yard, there's so many other distractions, and sometimes we can just sort of veer off the course a little bit. And when we get back into the car and we start driving home, thinking about this horse, sometimes we do kick ourselves and think, I, I never asked about that, or I never asked about this. So do have that list of questions logged in your brain. So going back to um, the adverts, what can an image tell us about um, before we go and see the horse? Photos and videos, as we know, are just a snapshot in time designed to show the horse's best attributes. Can we find out anything from them which might be useful to us? We could note the season when the photo or video is taken. For example, if it appears to be spring or summer, as in these photos, and we are in midwinter, this might be a flag, certainly for further questions. Here, we could ask the seller for more recent images, and if they're not forthcoming, we may not want to proceed any further with that horse. Technology can also be used to our advantage. You're asking for a video of a horse being trotted up or ridden in traffic, for instance, might not only save a trip if the horse is unsuitable, but also saves the seller time. At the end of the day, the image can only definitely tell us one thing. It's a horse. Yes, but is it the horse being advertised? And that we won't know until we see it. So to finish, we thought we would just show you how we promote our horses on the World Horse Welfare rehoming pages. And whilst we never sell, we want to give prospective rehomers as much information as we can about each horse. Lexi, well, you will notice, is a companion, and the information here begins to give us a picture of who she is. Lexi's temperament, likes, dislikes, qualities needed from the rehomer, as well as what Lexi can and can't do, 
are all here. And then we have additional information on the table. So if we were struggling with where to start, this could also give us some ideas for our wish list. Okay, to sum up then, we need to be honest and realistic about our experience, our lifestyle and our financial circumstances. We need to do that wish list of negotiables and non-negotiables, things that we can manage to control. We need to use the internet on our searches and use that technology that's available to us. We need to list the questions so that when we speak to the seller on the phone, we can ask the right questions. And obviously when we go and do um, a live visit to the host, we can also um, have a list of questions there. Don't ever feel pressurized from peer pressure or pressure from the actual seller. Um, and common things are, well, I've got somebody else coming to see it tomorrow um, and everything else. Take your time when you are there. There will be a horse of a lifetime out there for you that suits your experience, your lifestyle and your budget. Please don't feel pressure. Just buy once and buy for life. Thank you. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you. As you say, a degree of repetition there, but some re repeating some really important points. So thank, thank you very much for that. Just to remind you, if you're on Facebook, please keep your questions coming through the comments section. And if you're on um, Zoom, then please put your questions on the Q&A section. But do please upvote other questions because that helps um, get through, um, see where there's most interesting questions being asked. And Ben, I'll come to you first. The, the, uh, it's come through Facebook, but lots of people have asked it. Are there any telltale signs that the horse may have been doped to make it quieter or given butte to mask pain? No. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really simple answer, isn't it? Um, uh, quite a good telltale sign is that it's sound. So if it's sound, perhaps it's had... But no, I, I mean, no, there is no way of knowing that's why that blood sample is there. Um, uh, you, you, I don't know how experienced some of you are, but you're probably aware if you see young racehorses out on the gallops, two, three-year-olds, they've probably had a particular drug called ACP, ACE Promazone, that it's commonly used to keep a horse quiet. So you can ride it, which is probably a, a, a fair thing. But if you get the dosing right, you cannot tell that animal has had any sedation. And then you've got all the herbal products that aren't, aren't um, wouldn't show up on a test, for example. Um, but they don't really, whether they truly have any effect or I don't know. Um, the, the use of magnesium karmas is common. Um, but um, on the other hand, those are the sort of things that you can't, um, they're not detectable by that blood test. But if a horse, you know, if you find out it's been on a magnesium karma, then, then you've probably got to use one yourself. It's just slightly bad luck. I mean, you get to know how a horse behaves and, um, and you get to know its personality. And that's one of the keys of a five stage vetting to me is not the fact that I've, is the fact I'm spending more time with the animal. Um, yeah. I've done most of the stuff in the two stages. I've looked at his eyes and his heart and felt its legs and done the flexion tests and the, lunge on, the lunging and so on. But I, I spend more time and I see it ridden and then I get to know its personality. And I suppose you would pick up signs that it might have had that personality modified by, by chemicals, but it, but to be honest, um, uh, there is no real way of telling. And um, Alison and Tony, uh, Ben mentioned the, sort of the herbal products. I mean, I suppose it's one thing is how much we believe that they are effective. And I guess it probably varies from horse to horse. But anything else that you in terms of I think someone's um, put about when you visit the yard is in terms of things to look out for. Yeah, I think when you first step onto the yard, um, you, you need to look at the environment that the horse is kept in. Is it a very, very small, quiet yard or is it a big um, sort of busy commercial yard? And obviously that will have a bearing on if you were to purchase that horse, whether you're going to be changing his environment. Because some horses, when, after purchase, there may be nothing wrong with them at all, but just changing their routine and changing that environment from one to another, that can change a horse's character. So that's one thing to be aware of. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And for, totally unintentionally, that was the second question uh, up there, which is great. Um, Katie's asked, what about purchase, purchasing an ex racehorse? Um, Alison, any particular views on that before and in terms of pitfalls before I ask Ben? No, I think just to be aware of um, 
the horse's history, know where it's come from and why it's being sold. Um, you know, the horses, race horses are particularly traceable. Um, so if it's if it's been passed around and had lots of different homes, you can do lots of searches on the internet to find out. So it's really worth doing your homework before you um, go out to see the horse. Yes, you're absolutely right in terms of you know race horses. You know their history if they've got to the racetrack is is, is clear. It, it's certainly their racing history is all there. Ben, any further thoughts on buying X race horses? Um, what always amazes me is how variable they are. They're just extraordinary. I mean you see some amazing x race horses that go into showing and um, riding horse classes and do amazing well and got a really relaxed personality and so on. and then you've got the complete lunatic so i te and, and it applies to all those other things you were talking about I, I tend to look at the horse earlier the other guys were talking about investigating the sellers and and what sort of people they are and so on now that is important but i'm looking at the horse i'm not looking at the person and getting to know that horse's personality, whether it's an X race horse, I mean, you know, whether you're buying it, uh, you know, some would say I wouldn't necessarily buy a five-year-old Welsh Section A for my my leading rein pony daughter, but but people do, you know, they're they're all different, and you're looking at that individual animal. Yes, there are certain personality traits, and you've got to be a bit wary of a thoroughbred, but some sometimes. I prefer a thoroughbred because it just jiggles about quite a lot and, and, and ponces about and you look quite good on it. Whereas a warm blood is lazy as hell and you've got to get your spurs in, get it. And every now and then, when you're not aware of it, it just explodes. And sometimes, you know, the thoroughbred's more predictable. So it's, it's, it, is, it is looking at that individual animal. Thank you, Ben. Obviously always using spurs um, uh, as, as a... For dressage ethical training aid um emma's asked ben can kissing spines be picked up during a five-stage vetting good i've just just nearly finished right typing that answer emma um so it's really complicated but um those x-rays you saw where you get what's called dorsal spinous process impingement so a horse has 18 ribs um and so you everything's packed into quite a short space and the dsps are the 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 um the uh the dorsal spinous process that sticks up of each of those 18 thoracic vertebra and that's where you sit now those dsps can touch in as 50 percent of horses that does not mean if, if you've got on an x-ray of dorsal spinous process impingement uh, that horse has kissing spines kissing spines is a clinical manifestation where the animal feels pain so there is active rubbing of those DSPs causing pain. So the animal will show signs. It might be painful when you palpate the back. So that's an important part of stage one. And stage four, you press on the back in along the midline in the way that you do every day of your life as a vet. And you, the key is how it feels along the midline where the DSPs are and the interspinous ligament different to where the muscle, muscles are either side. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's got kissing spines. You also look at how the horse behaves when it's mounted. Does its head go off? Does it move off? And you look how it moves when it's ridden. You also look at the conformation of the back. But it doesn't mean that uh, it's got dorsal spinous process impingement. And having dorsal spinous process impingement on x-rays does not mean it's necessarily got kissing spines. What I like to say to people is you've got to have both. You've got to, if you've got a suspicion, clinical suspicion, then take an x-ray. If you've got clinical suspicion and DSP impingement on x-ray, then that is a diagnosis. But you've got to have two. You can't just have one. So the, a simple answer to your question is no, you can't see kissing spines on just physical examination. Um, excellent. Thank you. Well, did you write all of that? Blimey, that, that's quite impressive. Uh, yeah, I need oh. to me to finish. <laughs> um, Alison, a question about documentation. What, what documentation should you insist on in, when you're uh, buying a horse other than the passport? Well, the passport's the main documentation. That's, that's what's going to tell you um, anything that's known about the horse. Um, and it depends really what horse you're buying. I mean, if you're buying for breeding... Um, you know, if you're buying for breed, sorry, then you want to see that it's registered possibly uh, with a bright breed society. If it's got a, a competition history, you want to, to be able to see evidence of that. But also what's really important is to make sure that documents, any documents you are seeing are for that horse. And also if you're able to uh, scan the horse for a microchip 
to that's one way that you can check that that they are one and the same that's a really important thing to do and in terms of proof of ownership ben you said earlier that getting a one you buy the horse to get a receipt absolutely um lots of reasons why but the, the key i mean to be fair but a lot of court of laws don't court of law doesn't really understand this either but a passport is not an ownership document yeah. um, and as we well know owners often don't update the ownership with the ownership within the passport um, so uh, it's a slightly forward argument anyway but the key is a financial transaction as it is with any piece of property um, and that is the only true evidence. And an insurer will ask to see the receipt of proof of purchase. When you take out an insurance on an animal, they'll ask to see a copy of its passport. They now often require it to be vaccinated, but they'll ask to see a copy of the receipt as well and the vetting certificate. And what we find is they sometimes require those five, 10 years later when you make a claim. Um, and the same may be apply, um, uh, apply to lots of other things as well. So a receipt is, is, is so important. Ben, you did cover this, I think, but how much would x-rays usually cost as part of an additional vetting? You know, I didn't cover the cost of the vettings, uh, of the x-rays, and it does vary. Now, I, I, I'm of the school, it depends on the value of the animal. If you start going above 10,000, the insurers require uh, x-rays, um, and they always require to have the shoes taken off. Um, but um, often when you go above that value, insurance isn't actually an issue. People aren't insuring the animals if they're paying 20, 30, 40,000 pounds. Um, and I have the discussion with the, the purchaser of what x-rays to take. And we often end up taking what I call a full set, which is front feet, um, including the vicular views, all four fetlocks, four views, or both hocks, four views, both stifles, two views, DSPs, and sometimes necks. And sometimes with necks, uh, uh, I send them off for a report from a diplomat to uh, assess them for wobbler syndrome risk. So it, all and the cost can be all those in between. Yeah. But a full set, uh, including DSPs, would be £550 on top of your original three to £400. So you're rapidly approaching £1,000. This includes VAT. Um, if you have neck on top of that, that'll be another 100 And if you want a wobbler syndrome assessment, then that's another 100 on top of that. Um, so um, uh, x-rays are uh, interesting. As I said, you've got to have that debate before you start as whether what are you going to achieve? You're, are you, you're looking for for things that may that look like pathology but may not be pathology in an otherwise healthy animal that will flag up um, all sorts of issues if you go ever come to resell the animal or anything else so once you decided to commit to those x-rays a you've got to listen to what they say to you um, and b uh, you've got to accept the consequences of taking them and they're a victim of their own success you know we didn't take any of these x-rays before cordless digital x-raying came along it's purely yeah. a slightly a victim of its own success Thank you. Blimey, ben, running with you is like, I imagine, training with Sebastian Coe. You, you, you go extremely quick, but thank you for that. Um, you know that's uh, not true. <laughs> um, Tony, um, quite a few questions around confirmation. And in your view, because I know you're, you're, an exp you're very experienced outside world's horse welfare, how much will confirmation influence your choice? Uh, confirmation is obviously important um, in the fact of what I want that animal to actually do. Um, so if we were looking at to go eventing uh, and hopefully at, at a higher level, then obviously you want to be looking at, at you know, as an, as an athlete. Um, however, for lower level things, then confirmation really doesn't focus that important. Um, however, if there is a, a, a horrendous confirmation defect on the horse, then obviously your vet would then um, advise you so listen to you what your vet said and and as Ben said earlier you know when he has the um, buyer with him he will you know ask the buyer what you want this horse for you know what are your aspirations to do with this horse and if it has got a few little bumps and whatever and it's not going to make any difference to what they wanted to do then obviously the vet can say well yes it has got this or it has got that however for what your level is and what you want to do you shouldn't have any problems so you know speak to your vet and take their advice as well as yeah thank you um uh, Alison, I, I i think i know the answer to this but maya's asked what would problems what would you see as deal breakers in a pre-purchase examination if you're buying and a vet does a ppe what would be the deal breakers <laughs> 
that's a really tricky question, isn't it? What would, do you know, but that the deal breakers would depend on what your expectations are. What's on your wish list? What is it that you want? And what are your non-negotiables? You know, if you don't want a horse that's bad in traffic or that naps or that, I don't know, has have been said to buck, then, you know, it everything depends on what your preferences are. Um, and everyone, it doesn't matter whether you're experienced or novice, you'll have things that you, you can accept and things that you definitely won't. So that is, I, I would say, is what the deal breakers are, what your yeah. non-negotiables are. Absolutely. No. Um, ben, do you, anything to add to that? I think safety is the key, uh, as, as we said. Uh, and I, I reiterate this to most dealers uh, to vetting is, yeah, you might you might get one past them in terms of it's a bit lame or, or whatever. But the key you what you don't want on on your conscience or on your record is a is a, um, a, a manslaughter claim because someone's been thrown off by a dangerous animal. Um, and uh, and there are dangerous animals out there uh, and uh, people are trying to sell them. So safety is the key. Obviously, soundness and and you know what is soundness. Uh, I would avoid anything that's what I would call welfare sound. There's performance soundness. There's welfare soundness. Obviously, anything that's welfare sound, I try and avoid. But it's also important to know what's going to happen to the animal. Um, but uh, yeah, safety is the key. Brilliant. Um, we, we, there's a question there from Michelle about doping, um, d which we've we've already covered off. Um, Liz has asked Tony, feather mites, d don't touch or can you check that they have been treated and gone before the horse is delivered? Any thoughts on that? Uh, feather mites is almost a little bit sort of cosmetic. They can be treated by a vet. Um, and I'm sure Ben will give you the uh, correct answer on this, but I'm, I'm sure they, they wouldn't fail for a for having feather mites because they're easily treatable really and as long as you can manage them um that's going back to your wish list you know what are the non-negotiables yes absolutely um, I, th I think rose i think if the animal is feathered it, it may well have mites or, or mange and, and i think the key there is some people who are buying don't realize that it's a bit like buying a gray as well it's going to get melanomas later on in life you know, and often you find yourself in a betting where people don't know that. And a lot of us in the horse industry assume people know that. So sometimes that those conversations can be very long. Ben, a couple of just specific questions here around diseases. Um, a recurrent uveitis in, in horses, will, will, will that be picked up uh, in an eye examination? God, I've just got to the last word in that answer. There is often signs of recurrent uveitis inside the eye, which is why we use an ophthalmoscope. And how significant? Uh, so, I mean, so if an animal gets is getting recurrent uveitis, which you, the person seems to be in Germany, it's far more common in Germany than in the UK. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, we, we, we don't see it that often in the UK. Sometimes we see signs that a horse may have had uveitis in one eye and we discuss the risk of that with the with the buyer, but there is a risk attached to that, so they need to be fully aware of what, of what they're buying. And then also a question about equine polysaccharide storage myopathy, worth testing for that? Um, in my, I've never tested for it in a pre-purchase examination. Does that answer that question? Fine, brilliant, okay. Um, so uh, Samantha's asked a really good question here um, because there's obviously a, we talked about a process. So what state you obviously you, you see a horse and then you, you do your sort of due diligence and and you may go out and visit the horse. What at what stage? Um, um, Tony, I'll come to you first and then open it up. At what stage in the process would you actually do that? Get the vetting done. Uh, that, that would be in the last stage, really, before you'd make that decision. Um, so obviously you do your first uh, initial um, phone calls to the seller uh, and then obviously you go and view it live, you go and ride it and do all what you all the trials that you could do uh, to have a look at that horse. Um, and then obviously what we, what we try and say is, you know, take advice from a professional or your instructor, you know, show them what you've seen, tell them about, about the horse um, and then decide, right, this is going to be the horse for me. However, I want to have it vetted and then follow the veterinary's advice on that horse. And once again, be honest and realistic and tell the vet 
of your capabilities and everything else, even if you don't know them or you do know them, you know, make sure you lay it out and you tell them exactly what you want this horse for. So the vet is going in there with a picture of what your capabilities are and everything else. And ideally, like Ben said, if you can go to the vetting as well, it's a lot easier there because you can discuss um, whilst the vetting is in progress, obviously, with the vet, anything that they do find or uh, any questions that you do have. Brilliant. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm very sorry, Joanne's given us a story about how she bought a horse. Um, she, she's actually in Ireland and bought a horse that hasn't worked out uh, and the dealer now won't take it back. What what happens, Ben, when you um, what advice would you give to someone? They buy a horse, they get it vetted and then it, as far as they can see, there's real problems almost straight away. What, what advice would you give? Um, I've just written the answers to that, but it's I've, I've been quite brief in the answer. It was really tricky. So the key in the UK, you're you're protected by the Consumers Act 2015, which is quite a potent act. And essentially, you are, particularly if you're dealing with a dealer, but arguably with any seller, you are entitled to your money back if you don't like the goods. Um, you don't have to particularly even say why. You have to. You, you're, it, it's quite clear. But with a hardened dealer, it is like pulling teeth getting them to acknowledge that so your solicitor needs to get really heavy yes they will hide behind the vetting if you feel the vet has been negligent during the process then you should seek compensation from the vet and vets have negligence or indemnity insurance for that purpose and uh, to tell you that half the claims um, that the that negligence uh, our insurers get involve PPEs, just tell you what a risky old business it is predicting the future. Sometimes one is just unlucky. The vetting may well, it was probably or very likely to be done in good faith. The x-rays were done. You've done all you can. Yeah, um, if, uh, if you don't like the goods and they're not suitable, then you should be able to return them and get your money back. But that does require a lot of effort and the full force of the law to achieve that. Okay, thank you. So, Alice, I mean, on that, there's no easy answer, is there? And, and, and as Ben said quite clearly, you can't predict the future. So sometimes people, you're just unlucky, but sometimes obviously things are being masked and you just need to, the, the more work you can do in, in preparing yourself all the way through and not making quick purchases, certainly buying, um, and that's a question actually, to, to lead on to from that, Alison, is that from the World Horse Welfare perspective, we, we do get a lot of people now who buy horses unseen is there anything crazier than that that is quite remarkable isn't it because you know like we said in our presentation you know if you're just going by an advert or a video even um a photograph how do you even know and we we have had calls in from people who've seen a beautiful photograph been drawn in by it and then the horse turns up on the on the lorry and it looks surprise surprise nothing like what was in the photograph and actually a quick that's why on the slide I kind of recommended um, uh, checking the photograph as well because it's well known that you know photographs can be taken from beautiful horses competing and, and slung into an advert so doing your due diligence checks first is really really important yes don't buy unseen but people are it's very easy to do. Um, Tony, I'll, I'll fling this one at you. I think Ben might actually be answer, uh, t typing an answer. But how, tips on how to judge whether a horse is sound before paying for a vetting, as I've yet to view a sound horse. This is a question um, um, on, from Facebook. Any any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you, 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 when you go and see the horse, uh, obviously, you'd want to trot it up on the hard um, before you even ride it. Um, and once again, just, just, you know, look for that initial nod of the head all the basics to look at the foot first um, and then work out and look at the shoeing and the state on, on, on the legs as well look for any blemishes uh, anything swollen anything out of the ordinary um, and if you have any ifs obviously you know that you can ask about should you want to pursue a vetting um, or if you're put off by it in, in, in the first place then don't waste your money um, getting getting a vet to tell you exactly the same um, just just walk away. Don't feel pressurised. Just walk away. 
Can I also add as well that I think we, you know, there's lots of research available now and a lot of people that are quite knowledgeable in horse behaviour. And just looking at some of the videos that are posted online of horses for sale, the horses don't necessarily look unsound in the videos, but just their, their facial expressions, their whole demeanour just doesn't feel right. And you kind of think, you know, this, this, there's something not quite right with the horse. So if you get that feeling, you're probably correct. And that's why it's really important as well to take somebody experienced with you. Yeah. you less experience. it's a, brilliant. Thank you. Alison. That's a really good point. And there's lots of interesting work, especially through Sue Dyson around behavioral ethrograms and actually reading what the horse is telling you um, uh, there, which is great. Um, ben, I think you might be uh, answering a question, but if you're buying a youngster, two year old, do you get it vetted? Just written, I just sent it, yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, the, the examination will be limited and the cost will be mitigated accordingly by the vet doing it. But you'll be able to look in the eyes, uh, look for any eye issues, blindness, cataracts, uh, uveitis, as I mentioned before, listen to the heart, listen for murmurs, assess the horse for symmetry, which may show signs of um, congenital issues may causing lameness, uh, lumps, bumps, you might be able to see the horse free reined in an indoor school or a suitable outdoor school. So you can assess soundness that way. Try it up in hand, but probably not do flexion tests or lunging. So you can do a hell of a lot in a two year old. And uh, you, you do feel a bit of media if you buy it and it can't see out of one eye. Excellent. Thank you. I feel like I've been back with Sebastian Coe on the training track again, but thank you for that. Um, um, Emma's just asked a large majority of World Horse Welfare horses as advertised. Uh, advertises companion horses does this mean they can never be ridden yes that does mean because as um allison has already mentioned in, in the presentation emma that you know we go through a, a, a lengthy process and you know obviously we don't want horses to be companions we want you know ideally that, that they be able to to be like hacks or, or or whatever but there is a reason for that um but also uh, do look at the other centers uh, at what the horse is available there and you can always give us a call if you, if you have a a specific need so i uh, hope that answers that um sarah has asked any uk horse purchasing websites which are better than others or is it potluck uh, that's a really good question a alison I'm, I, ben i think is answering it but i'm going to come to you first on that one i think it is potluck and again it's really important to do your research what well, you know quite a lot of the the time when you're looking for horse, you get a feel, don't you? There'll be certain websites that you like, that you like the feel of, the way horses are advertised, you know, all of those things. So a lot, of, because it's such an emotional uh, thing for a lot of people, actually it's probably down to your personal preference. But if you've done all your checks, I don't think it makes much difference which, you know, which website you go to. Brilliant. Um... Thank you. You've just answered a question there, Ben, but I think it might be worth just coming back on that. Someone actually had a horse on loan um, for a year and then was asking, should I get it vetted if I then decide to, to buy it? Um, what, what, in terms of getting that loan period, I mean, that's obviously can be fraught with, with challenges as well. What, what's your thoughts on that? Me personally, I, I said that I would get it vetted. Um, but obviously you you have the animal, you know the animal, you feel it's sound um, and so on. So you are looking for the unexpected. Probably the, the insurance issues are probably the, the, the most important thing there. Um, but uh, I mean, it is quite a common scenario that we do this and it's rare to turn up things. But sometimes you turn up things that you wish you'd known about before you could hand it back. Brilliant. Um, I did a good Facebook question here for you, Tony. We're, we're getting to the end, but uh, we'll try and get a few more in. Would, one for you, Tony. Would it be good to buy a horse off someone who knows a lot about horses? Yes, definitely, because obviously their reputation um, could well be on the line. Um, but as long as you go in there with the right mindset, know exactly what your capabilities and experiences are, um, and you actually are honest with them and tell them. And ideally in the real world, we'd love them to match you up with that, that perfect sort of uh, horse. Um, obviously you've got to do your homework and you've got to listen to sort of, you know, unbiased opinions. Brilliant. Um, uh, ben, a question, any advice on buying foals, please? Um, 
I, I find it, I mean, it's not my area of speciality and I have vetted a few foals um, and you're asked all sorts of questions, how big will it get and all these sort of things. And, and, and uh, I, I find some of those questions difficult to answer. Um, uh, so uh, as you, I, I don't know if you know Rolls, but uh, a friend of ours, and my goddaughter is a professional inventor and I vetted a foal for her, um, for her to take on eventing to top level. Uh, and, and it's doing very well in Pony Club now. So it's, 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 it's difficult, but uh, there are things, yeah, the, the eyes is really important. Um, checking for congenital abnormalities, soundness, leg bending and so on. Um, but it is, a, it is a, a sometimes more of a specialist area. Brilliant. And Michelle's asked an interesting question here. Can, uh, can you specify on a vetting for a wish for a specific thing that you want? And she suggested clean legs. Uh, but can you sort of highlight areas that you're especially interested in? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's really important. We say when we're booking in the vetting and when I speak to the, the buyer beforehand, is there anything specifically you're worried about? Um, and, uh, and often that can relate to past experiences or friends or colleagues past experiences. And so hopefully you can mitigate their worries in that particular condition beforehand um, or kissing spines, for example, being one. Um, and or you, if, you, uh, if they say to you, uh, can you keep an eye out for those sarcoids or that splint or so on? It, it sort of slightly underlines it that you mustn't gloss over it because it is quite easy to gloss over things that one feels are completely normal. So it also tells me about the buyer if they've asked specifically about things that you think, well, you know, if they ask, you know, about a splint or an angle of a leg or a crack on a hoof, it also tells me about their level of knowledge and, and how I'm pitching uh, my examination findings to them, if that makes sense. Brilliant. Listen, we could we could go on, but um, uh, thank you so much. I, I, hopefully, we've got through a good selection of questions there for for for, for people to take take on board. And Ben, thank you very much for for answering some of the questions directly as well. Um, so a, a huge thank you. Our apologies for not being able to get through all the questions, um, but I think we should draw it to a close there. But before I do that, it would be great just to get some final thoughts from our three panelists. Just what you think are the key take messages for you um, and in no particular order I'll come to Tony first. <laughs> okay well uh, for me it would be listen don't overhorse yourself be honest with yourself about your capabilities and about what you want to do uh, and what you want to achieve so do not overhorse yourself. Brilliant thank you Tony. Um, Alison. Uh, do your research be take take your time and be very honest with yourself but expect honesty from others as well. Brilliant, thank you. And, and Ben? Um, just going to the whole experience, um, whether you're a previous horse owner or not, with an open mind and open eyes. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And so listen, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to, to Ben, to Alison and to Tony. Um, for those of you who are interested, we do have an advice uh, on our advice page on our website. We have lots of useful information about buying and selling horses. And we'll put that link in the chat function now. And also do remember, if you're planning on uh, buying a horse, then do consider loaning from World Horse Welfare or another one of the charities. Because as Alison and Tony mentioned, you honestly won't get a better better vetted horse than the MOT that loan horses that come through World Horse Welfare and the other charities and, and, and will be completely honest so please do consider that in addition to or instead of of, of purchasing because there are some great um, horses and ponies available but unfortunately no zebras um, so um, if you do have any other um, suggestions for what we might cover in future webinars then please do send those through to education at worldhorsewelfare.org. We'd love to, to, to hear from you. Um, just to remember, our next webinar on the March the 31st in a fortnight's time is on alternative grazing systems where we'll look at track systems, equicentral, rewilding, and the use of woodlands and moorlands. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate my thanks uh, to Ben, to, to Tony, and to Alison for giving up your time this evening. It's been hugely informative, lots of positive comments coming in. Um, and to thank everyone uh, for joining us. I hope 
you're well in these very, very strange times, getting brighter. Maybe next in a fortnight's time, I won't have to close my curtains and there'll still be light outside because the clocks will have changed. So looking forward to that, looking for, forward to seeing you in uh, a fortnight's time. In the meantime, take care and thank you so much.